All right, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser, one of the pastors here. Uh, I hope you'll take this seriously. Uh, take this, I already put one in my filing cabinet, so this is number two, right? You have your filing cabinet right here, your Bible. Uh, some of you say, well, I got an electronic one. Well, stick it somewhere in your pocket. Uh, but I want you to, t- to uh, here's, here's the application before I ever begin. Put, t- put this somewhere this week where it will remind you of its presence, right? Stick it up in your car, on your mirror, whatever the case may be. At the minimum, uh, ask God to bring somebody to your mind who needs to hear that Christ is risen. Somebody needs to hear that Christ is risen. Uh, and it might be somebody who doesn't know Jesus altogether, but it also might be somebody who's just under the weight of life, and they need to know that uh, death doesn't triumph, uh, and ultimately Christ does. So I don't know what, who it is, uh, whether it's going to guide you to pray uh, about people in your office, uh, and I would, I would in, encourage you to anticipate that God's going to give you an opportunity to, to represent him somewhere if you ask for it. So uh, take that. Uh, these will be coming out over the next week, so uh, they won't be the last time. And if you want more, uh, we'd be glad to provide for you if you do that. Uh, we're in the book of Romans, and we're in our series in the book of Romans. And so I want to invite you uh, to open up to Romans chapter 1 as we get underway. Uh, we're not going to be in Romans 1 today as our topic, uh, but <clears throat> we're going to be in Romans 11. Uh, this is one of the things where... Uh, Paul is assuming, as we read this book, uh, that we know a little bit of the backstory, and we've been trying to talk about that as we've worked our way through. Uh, Any of you that uh, are readers or uh, even movie watchers, if you watch movies that are in a series, uh, you know that you can really miss out uh, on a lot of what's going on in a given episode if you don't know what happened before. Uh, And of course, one of the things that's behind the whole book of Romans, as is the New Testament, is the first half of the biblical story, uh, the Old Testament and what God has done uh, in preparation for the arrival of Jesus. So Paul, in the section that we're going to be in, is going to take us back uh, into that story uh, because Paul wants to uh, make it clear uh, that God uh, has set out a trajectory, a program, and he has not failed. Uh, And he's not going back on his word. Uh, And there's so many implications for that, and you'll see as we get to the end, uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the implications for our lives as we think about the character of God that's displayed over these three chapters in particular as we think about them. Right, so we begin back, right, the story of the book of Romans, right, we're well in uh, to the book of Romans, but this is really, if you want to look at it, this is Paul, the apostle, who's been appointed by God as a a special apostle to go to the Gentiles, uh, which is really a little bit of God's humor because uh, Paul was a Jew that hated Gentiles. Uh, He hated them so much that uh, he never associated with them. Uh, And when this new thing, this new rabbi came out, Jesus, and he started talking about what God was doing uh, and invited his followers to take this message that God was opening his kingdom, that he was opening rebels, an opportunity to come back under his benevolent rule, uh, that Paul was none too happy with that message, that it was, number one, uh, he thought Jesus was no true rabbi, Uh, And number two, uh, he thought the message was wrong. And so he went around trying to kill the messengers, uh, the people who were uh, representing Jesus. So Paul was a ringleader, uh, and he says himself that he tried to destroy the church. And what Paul meant by that is he tried to take these followers of Jesus who went around proclaiming that Jesus was the promised king that the Old Testament had looked forward to, that he had come and opened up the possibility for all those who had rebelled against God and now were outside the garden, outside of fellowship with him, that God had opened the way back and Jesus had done everything necessary for them to come back under God's benevolent rule and out from under his wrath. Well, what had the king done? The king had come and died on the cross. He took the punishment for the sin that the rebels had rightly deserved. And then he came up from the grave and won the life that they had lost. And all they needed to do is put their faith in the king. And so the messengers now are going out and saying, the king has come and the king has opened the way into the kingdom. Repent of your sin, of your rebellion against the king. Believe on him. Come under his benevolent rule because the king is coming. 
right? And when the king returns, he's going to come with judgment and vindication for his people and judgment for his enemies. So Paul disagreed, and Paul went about trying to oppose them. Uh, He was responsible for killing some of them until God met him dramatically on the Damascus Road and brought him to himself and then took the uber-Jew, Uh, the opponent of everything of Jesus and especially of this message going to the Gentiles, he took the uber Jew and made him his special missionary to the Gentiles. So here's Paul. Now he's writing to a church that's well established. And Paul saw his ministry, you can read about this in Romans 15, we'll get there. He saw himself as a pioneering missionary. God had called him to take this gospel to non-Jews and he was supposed to go where the gospel had never been preached. And so Paul was not a pastor. He was not uh, anchored in some location uh, shepherding a body of believers. But Paul was meant to go and establish churches, and then he would appoint elders. Once it got healthy pastors, then he would move on to a new location and keep on going. Well, Paul's on his way. He thinks he's done everything that he can up to Rome. So he's moving, he's moving west alongside the Mediterranean, uh, the north side of the Mediterranean coast. He's moving west. He's moving out there. He said, I've done everything. Now he's writing to this church in Rome, and he says, I want you to take me on as a missionary to get me to Spain. And immediately we know that Paul assumes that the Rome doesn't need him to come evangelize because it's a really healthy, growing church. And you can read about that when you get to Romans 16. There's a ton of people in the church in Rome, and there are very mature believers. But in behind this wonderful story, behind this church, are racial tensions. And Jews and Gentiles have been brought in by belief into Jesus into this new community but they're having a, whole t- a hard time getting over the old divisions. They're having a hard time. And so God has transformed them, made them new, but they've got some real difficulties. And we get to see it played out, especially in our passage today and then in chapter 14. So the Jews and Gentiles are arrogant toward each other. And again, the, the, what, what Paul is asking, he knows, is absolutely immense. What he's asking of them, these old hatreds that are built in from birth, Right, the kinds of things that we get to see play out in places like Palestine today, right, where people are taught from birth uh, that, uh, for example, that Jews are their enemies and that Jews, it's, it's good and you're a, a martyr and you'll go to heaven if you kill them. And you're to celebrate those. That's the kind of animosity that we're dealing with in this ancient contest, context where you have this hostility. Well, now they've been... Uh, They've both come together and believed in Jesus Christ, and now they're supposed to call each other brothers and sisters. They're supposed to love each other. And the Jews used to call the Gentiles dogs, and the Gentiles used to call the Jews mutilators of the flesh because they circumcised their men. So they had no love for one another, and here they are now, and now they're trying to work out this new community. And Paul would never ask them to do this merely on a human level because he knows something supernatural has to happen to make it happen. And so Paul is going to tell them that something supernatural has happened and that they do have the resources to make it happen, and he's not going to let them divide from each other. And so one of the things that happens right in in modern uh, uh, the West, in in the modern West and around the world, is the church itself struggles to live into this new reality that God's made possible in Christ. We still have divisions along racial lines. We still have divisions on socioeconomic lines. We have divisions on age stage lines, right? I like my congregations to be young, or I like mine to be old, or those kinds of things. And God says, I've made something new, and I want you to draw on the resources I have in Christ to make this family work. So Paul never lets them off the hook. And one of the things you might think that Paul would have, right, some some moms here, right, when you've got your kids in the house, uh, you're trying to get them to play together, and eventually you're just gone, it's hopeless. And so you banish them to their respective rooms and tell them, just get, go away from each other. Don't touch each other. You go in your room, you go in your room, you go in your room, and just stop it, right? So Sarah's shaking her head right there. Uh, so that's happened in the Mays house, right? But in, in the realization, you, you expect Paul to go, okay, I'm tired of it, Jews, I can't take it anymore. Gentiles, I can't take it anymore. Jews, go have your own church. 
Gentiles, go have your own church. And, and then at least maybe once a month or something, come together for a potluck and say, we love Jesus, right? Instead, he says, no, 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 you're a family. You can't. You can't break apart. You can't turn from one another. And matter of fact, for you to turn back from it is to deny that God has unleashed a power that has transformed you and transformed you as a community. And you're going to lose your witness to the world. You're going to lose the joy of this new community that God wants you to know. So hang together, be the people of God. When we get to chapter 12, we're going to get to see the contours of what it looks like for this new community. Okay? So Paul begins back in 1, 16 and 17, and this is where we began. He says, I got to go back and I got to tell you the story of what God has done. And if you want to think about this, Paul is just taking the weight of God's work in history, of what God has done, what he is doing, what he will do through Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection by the power of the Spirit to make effective the, belief, the work of Jesus. What God has done, is doing, and will do in Christ by the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything. And so he's going to go back and tell the story, and what he wants to reclaim is not only individuals, he wants to bring men and women to life, he wants to rescue them from the penalty they deserve, he wants to rescue them from the power of sin that is distorting their lives and distorting their relationships, he wants to rescue individuals, but he also wants to create this new community that the way men and women treat each other, the way they behave as a group of people, the way you look at Jews and Gentiles and slave and free and old and young and educated and uneducated, and you see them not just hanging together, but actually loving one another, the world looks at that and says that cannot be explained by any human calculus. That can't be explained. And so it becomes a pointer to the reality of God's work in Christ, right? So we as a church, to live out the book of Romans, we cannot divide over socioeconomic lines. We cannot divide over racial lines. We cannot divide over age stage lines. We cannot lest we go back on the work of God and we miss out on his blessings. So that's what Paul wants to say. So he says here, I got to go back. I got to tell you the story. And he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, this good news. And he's going to tell us what this good news is because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And so the question is salvation saving from what? Save you from what? Well, the big issue here, of course, is our offense against God. You don't need to be saved from your employer, uh, from our crazy government, from um, uh, an oppressive spouse, from a crazy neighbor. Uh, you don't need to be saved from those things. You need a desperate deliverance from your offense against God. That's what you need to be delivered from because that's what's distorting every other area of your life. And that salvation, Paul says, is what I'm going to tell you about, is how one can be righted with God, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in this gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. How do we, how do we get righted with God? Well, by faith, and it's a faith that is characteristic of the whole of a person's life. You enter into a faith relationship with God, and that is the characteristic of the whole of that life. Now, so, as we work our way through, right, Paul's going to take us through the first half, and we've used this before, is he's going to display, well, what, why do you need this good news? Uh, why is it good news? And we start off in the first part, right, the first four chapters, he tells us that we're desperately uh, broken. We are uh, uh, apart from God. We're sinful. Uh, the description, uh, I was walking through this with a group of people this week, when you get to the middle of chapter 3, and he starts using the Old Testament to describe what the results of sin are in the lives of every individual. And I know sin is an old word, and uh, sin is a word that uh, people have tried to make uh, a funny word, right? Like something is sinfully good, right? Those kinds of things. Uh, but sin is, is a horrible thing. Uh, not only does it uh, uh, separate you from the God that you have been made for, but it destroys everything in your life, everything. And so when he gives this description, if you want to look in chapter 3, when he says there's no one righteous, not one, no one who understands, no one who seeks God, 
uh, when we decide that we don't need God, when he says he doesn't understand, he doesn't mean, he already said in chapter 1, that not that people don't know that God exists and what he demands. It means that since they've decided to approach life without God guiding and directing them, they don't understand who they are. They don't understand how to relate to other people. They don't understand what life is about. They don't understand life. And they don't seek God. And people say, well, there's a lot of religions. Yes, there are. But for Paul, everyone who does not submit to the God creator God who has stepped into the world in Jesus to rescue people, that he is the only God. And he is the God who has made us. He is the God who is pursuing us. He is the God toward uh, which his purposes, everything is moving. And so all seeking of other gods is ultimately empty and useless. Why? Because there are no other gods. There are no other deliverers. And really all those other seeking of other gods are simply just uh, uh, indirect ways for the seekers to worship themselves and elevate themselves to the place of God. Why? Because the, since there are no other gods, all the other gods are creations of the people who are worshiping them. Worshiping them. And all the things that the gods dictate are what they have decided the gods require of them. And so all of it is is uh, self-worship under the guise of religion. And so Paul says, no one seeks, no one seeks God. All have turned away and become worthless, and there is no one who does good, not even one. Right? Well, worthless in what sense? They, they have been disabled from living out the purpose and meaning of their lives as human beings. They've been rendered incapable of loving and being loved. They've been distorted in terms of their identity and purpose. And this is why Paul, and then, uh, you know, you all know, I was mentioning this earlier as we were meeting together, uh, our, our, um, our Congress is meeting with some hearings right now, uh, talking about the, uh, the qualities or the uh, negative aspects of TikTok, right? And uh, if you've read about TikTok, I'm not a, I don't get up here and preach against social media. That's not what I'm about here. Uh, but TikTok is a corrosive force in our culture. Uh, plenty of studies done that if a young person gets on TikTok within about three clicks, uh, they'll be in very, very dark territory. About three clicks. Uh, it's addictive. Uh, it's very much involved. Uh, in China, which is the source of TikTok, uh, they actually... Uh, uh, weed out uh, nine-tenths of the things that is made available to young people in the United States uh, because they don't want them to see it, uh, but they're very happy for us to be able to see it here. Uh, and TikTok is a corrosive thing that leads many people uh, literally right to the pages of people who are trying to discourage them from listening to their parents and bring them away from their parents so that they can adopt some sort of distorted sexual lifestyle. All right. That, that is a good, straightforward example of poison coming from the lips. We have a lot of that happening. But we also have people that are giving more benign poison, like, you know, you can save yourself. You can pull yourself up with your own bootstraps. Right? You can work it out. You don't need other people's help. You can look deeply within yourself and find out who you are. And matter of fact, uh, uh, you need to be whoever you think you are. Uh, and if anybody opposes you, they're evil. They're oppressive. Right? Paul says that when you have a corrupted heart, which is a heart apart from God, you can't help but to speak out of your heart. So Paul says right at the beginning, well, you need to be righted. And he says, Jesus is the answer. Well, how? By faith. And then he lays out all these things that come from that. You're reconciled with God. You're at peace with the God that formerly you were an enemy of. You're released from the bondage of sin in your life. You're freed from its penalty. You're remarried. He used this covenant language. You've been brought into a new relationship uh, with God so that you're no longer under the condemnation of God's standards as laid out in the Old Testament law. You're resourced. You're given the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you. And, and so Paul ends up in chapter 8 with poetry and rejoicing exactly where you would expect him to go. Now here's where we are in these three chapters. So this is something here to think about where Paul's going to take three chapters and build an argument, okay? So I'm only going to talk about chapter 11 today, but Paul's in a three-part argument that he's trying to develop, and right now he's actually returning to some questions that he raised at the beginning of chapter 3, but now he's going to come back and take them up in detail, 
okay? So he's going to begin, right, in 9, 1 to 6. And this is one of the things, even as Van was praying, Pastor Van was praying here at the beginning, uh, our concerns for our culture at large, our concerns for our own lives, our concerns for uh, the people that make up EBC, uh, all of those concerns, all of those prayers come from a heart yearning by God's grace for what God yearns for us. They don't come out of a desire to be in control of people's lives or to be merely censorious or, or judgmental, right? If, if God is true and the life that he has laid out in Scripture is true, we have a clear vision of human flourishing that the Scriptures give us. When we see people walk away from how God has made them, we see them walk away from God, it should bring tears to our eyes. It should make us grieve. Right? How we go about expressing that love, knowing that truth, right? that's a whole discussion that many of us need to have in the various circumstances that we find ourselves. Right? With family members, with friends, in society, there's all kinds of complexities to that. But one of the things that's very clear is that God has created us to worship him. And matter of fact, when we're away from him, life is broken. And when we're away from him, we've lost, we've lost the guidance that we need to navigate life. And so it's going to show up in all kinds of different ways. And so we as the people of God, if we love our neighbors, we're going to yearn for them to come to know the God of the Scriptures so that they can know the life that he's created them to enjoy. And so Paul starts this very, this is an exercise of tough love. These three chapters are really straightforward truth-telling, okay? But Paul says it over and over again that he says it with a broken heart. And Paul says, right, and Pastor Van talked about this last week, he is picturing in his own attitude the very attitude of God. Because God's attitude is, I, I've got my arms open wide, and I've offered right, for you to return and come underneath my loving rule, and you've been obedient, disobedient and obstinate over and over and over again, right? And so the answer to people who are disobedient and obstinate isn't to start telling lies so that they feel better about where they are. It isn't an answer to go back and tell lies so that we take the tension out of our relationship with them. Often the motivation for lying to people about the truth is that it, we're uncomfortable with holding on to the truth. Or we're afraid of the consequences of what people will do when we tell them the truth. They could reject us. They could hate us. They could say we're fanatics. They could do all kinds of things. If you say the truth with a tear in your eye, with a yearning in your heart, you still may get rejected. Okay? But the answer isn't to lie. The answer is to be a fixed point of compassion. To stay on the truth, to hold on to what's true with tears in your eyes and a yearning in your heart so that you don't become bitter or a righteous warrior or any of those kinds of things. Right? And so I, I will t we'll talk more and more about this. Paul is talking to people who literally hate him. Right? Paul, the, one of the ironies of Paul's life is he was the ringleader of the Jews who were persecuting Christians and especially Christian Jews. Now Paul is living a life persecuted by the people that he used to be the ringleader of. Right? So the first question is, he's going to come back to the issue because he has to deal with a problem that seems to have arisen in the minds of many, or at least Paul anticipates it, because it appears in the Old Testament God had promised that God was going to come, and he's actually going to quote the passage a little later on at the end of chapter 11, that the deliverer is going to come from Zion, and he's going to take away sin, meaning he's going to bring salvation to the Jews, right? The Jews have a unique place in God's plan in history. And so the deliverer is going to come and take away sin. But also, God had given a promise to the Jews that one day they were going to rule and reign alongside King Messiah and they were going to bring blessing to the nations through his benevolent rule and their rule alongside of him. So there's individual promises to Jews to be rightly related to God by faith and there's a national promise for that to be fulfilled. And that's what Paul's going to speak about here. And so they're looking at the circumstances on the ground and in Paul's own day, 
there are a few Jews who have come to Christ. Matter of fact, Paul is exhibit A. And he's going to list some, if you read in Acts cha- in chapter 16 of Romans, he'll talk about some of the ethnicity of some of his fellow con- converts, that they're fellow Jews. Right? But Paul says, I yearn in my heart for my fellow Jews to come to Christ. And the problem that's arisen is the majority of the Jews of Paul's time have not embraced the gospel. And Paul's saying, uh, and they're coming to him and saying, well, it looks like God hasn't been faithful to his promises. Look, all these Jews are missing out on salvation, and it certainly doesn't look like his national promises are coming to fruition. Right? And so Paul's going to come back that and deal with that. And first one, he just says right off the beginning in chapter 9, we can trust God's faithfulness that he's going to do it because it depends upon God and God's character as a faithful God. And so he has the power and the right to accomplish that. So we don't need to worry if God made a promise, he's going to keep it. And that's an important one for us to know. The promises that he gave to us, it's important to know that he's going to keep them. Both positively, if you have believed in Jesus Christ, God is a promise keeper. He will bring about the blessings that he's promised. But also it's a sobering thing to know that if you've rejected Jesus Christ, God is faithful to his promises and he will bring judgment. It depends on God and God alone. We don't determine his purposes. We can't take him off track. We can't coerce him out of that. It's God. And then the second one is that he comes back to his fellow Jews who have rejected this message. And he says, no, his, his promises are secure because God will guarantee they'll happen. Then in chapter 10, he comes back and says, no, the problem really is not with God. It's with the Jews because the word has always been near them. And now the word is absolutely crystal clear. In the Old Testament, it was a promise that a deliverer was going to come. Now we know who the deliverer is, right? As I teach at Cedarville, I always joke with my uh, Old Testament colleague, Dr. Miller, uh, and I've said this before, he gets to do a drum roll for a whole semester, right? So he's going, uh, and in the Old, in the old Testament, a uh, seed is going to come to fix what's going on in the garden because it's all broken. We're looking for Abraham. It's going to come from Abraham. Then it's going to come from David. Then it's going to be a suffering servant. And everybody keeps wondering, win, 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 who, 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 who. And then all of a sudden, New Testament comes, ta-da, Jesus, right? So I get to do the ta-da, right? I get to do the ta-da, Jesus is here. And so now the promise has come. We've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Now it's here. And Paul is saying the Jews are turning their back on the promise fulfilled in Jesus. We sang the song today right before I got up that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that says, In Jesus, all the promises of God are yes. Right? They've all come to fruition. Right? Now today we want to talk about the Gentile mission and whether or not God has been faithful. And then, as always, it ends up in praise and worship. Okay, here's my key thought. Key thought about this as we work over this panorama, and I know you'll be disappointed that we won't cover everything in detail. There's no way I can do that because you guys want to leave here at an appropriate moment, uh, like before one or something like that. So I'm not going to do that, but I will give you the main ideas as we work our way through, and I'm going to draw some conclusions from the end of this argument for us about our relationship with God. Now, I'll give you this one here. This is a popular saying here. I don't know who it's attributed to. I couldn't find who it was attributed to, but one of the happiest moments in life is when you find the courage to let go of what you cannot change. You could say that in a lot of different ways. Uh, when you find God's grace to embrace that which is true about you and true about God and let go of your, uh, your stories, your myths, your make-believe, your falsehoods. Um, what we want to talk about here about Paul is wanting to uh, confront them with the character of God in a way that it should wind up by God's grace and worship in awe, in being overwhelmed and feeling that that God is way beyond their capacity to figure out. And it should humble them before God and turn them out toward him in worship. Okay, So let's walk through it here and talk about what's going on. Well, the first one here, he raises the question, if you're in chapter 11, come to chapter 11, he raises the question then. I ask then, so if you're studying your Bibles, if Paul raises a question... Uh, One of the ways that you're studying this passage is that however you interpret what happens next, it should answer the question, 
right? It should answer the question. So Paul's trying to get you to think, I want you to think about this question. This is often what Paul does throughout the book of Romans. It's kind of a, a rhetorical technique to carry forward his argument. It's often referred to as diatribe. It's a, where he will take an opponent's question and he'll bring it to the surface, right? As if I know what you're thinking, so let me raise this question and then let's tackle it. And so here, I ask then, did God reject his people Israel? Now, the reason that pe- comes up is because he just talked about, right at the end, he referred to a prophecy by Hosea and one by Isaiah that talked about, right, how this message about Jesus is going to go out to the ends of the earth, and it's going to embrace people who are outside of Judaism, meaning Gentiles, right? In the biblical world, if you describe everybody, there's the Jews, and then everybody else, that's the Gentiles, okay? So he says here in uh, uh, verse 18 of of chapter 10, the voice has gone out into all the earth. There were words to the ends of the world. And then in verse 19, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. Then Isaiah says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. And then But regards to my own people, the Jews, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So he came to the end of this, and you've got two things that come up. God has extended his arms open. The Gentiles have come into his arms. Right now, he's not talking about every Gentile, but he's talking about a great ingathering of the Gentiles so that there's a huge number of Gentiles who are coming to Christ. And of course, Paul has seen this happen all over the Mediterranean world. He's going to city after city on his things. He's seen people come to Christ over and over and over again. And they have inquired, as you read through the book of Acts, that's when you take the trajectory, people are coming to Christ over and over and over again through city after city. But yet at the same time, as he goes to city after city, He goes into the synagogues, and by and large, he's rejected by the Jews. A few will come to Christ. If you want to read one just in a shorthand way, you can go to chapter 17 in the book of Acts and look at his ministry in Thessaloniki. And so he comes to Thessaloniki there, and he comes in. He preaches in the synagogue. He's hated by the Jews. A very few number of them come to Christ. The vast majority of the Gentiles who are interested in Judaism come to Christ as do some influential people, and then Paul and his converts are hated by the people in the synagogue. And then the synagogue leaders go to the secular leaders and then try to get the Christians in trouble with Rome. Now, that's been the pattern over and over and over again. So this has happened, and Paul is saying, well, what's going on, right? Does it mean that that God has somehow the promises he made to the Jews that really they failed, that they just failed, because it looks like it, to a large part, that they failed. And so the issue here, right, has God broken his word? And of course, that's really important to us who are trusting in God's promises in Christ. If he's broken his word in the past, uh, we have a pretty shaky foundation for trust in the future. Okay? So key idea here, one and two, I ask then, did God reject his people By no means, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. And so if you're with me here in this passage, Paul wants to say straight out, no, God, and and this this term foreknew here, if you want to look at a passage in the Old Testament, in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 2, this is a use of knowing. That's not that I just knew in advance but that I determined in prehistory, I determined beforehand to set my favor on this group of people, to enter into a particular relationship with them. In Amos 3, 2, it says, "Uh, of all the nations, only you have I known. And you're thinking, wait a minute, did God not know about the rest of the nations in the world like he was just only knew about the Jews? Is that why we have a Bible that's focused on them? No, what he's saying is, of all the peoples on the earth, only you have I entered into a special relationship with. Only you, right? And of course, through them, ultimately would come Jesus. And so, he's talking here about, did God reject his people whom he foreknew? No, he did not. And then he gives himself as exhibit A. Well, number one, I'm a Jew, 
and I have impeccable Jewish credentials. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. You can read more about Paul's credentials if you want to go to, the, to Philippians chapter 3. He says, I'm exhibit A, and then he gives a second from Scripture of Elijah. And he takes us back to the story of Elijah, where Elijah was in a dark place. You remember that, where Ahab and Jezebel were ruling Israel, a very godly king and queen, uh, no, uh, were ruling Israel, and they were killing the priests of Yahweh, the ones who were faithful to God. Uh, they had Jehoiada who was hiding a bunch of guys in a cave to try to keep them safe. And Elijah does battle on Mount Carmel, right? It's a tremendous demonstration of God's power, of his sovereignty. And then he has a crash. He just crashes and he runs out in the wilderness because Jezebel is going to kill him. And so he runs and runs and runs and finally he exhausts himself. He's out in the middle of nowhere, um, exhausted. God feeds him, lets him sleep for a long time. And then he starts complaining to God, God, I'm the only one that's left that's faithful. I'm the last of the faithful ones. And then God comes back and he doesn't say, no, no, all of them are faithful. No, he says here, God's answer, verse 4, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Well, 7,000 is a small number of hundreds of thousands of Jews. So in that period of time, what Paul is pointing to, what he said all along, is that God has always preserved a remnant. He's always held his arms out. He's always called the Jews to take advantage of their birthright, to come into my blessing. But sadly, they've rejected him. So God hasn't broken his word, right? And then the question wants to come up, well, then what's wrong? What's going on? We'll come to verse 7. Right? God hasn't broken his word because there's always been a remnant. He's always reached out. Well, what's happening? The people of Israel sought so earnestly they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. Okay? Now, this is one of the most difficult things in Scripture was what happened here is uh, when he s says they were chosen and hardened, one of the things that we don't want to flatten this out is that always God's actions, and we use this over and over again, God's sovereignty never functions in Scripture to diminish the significance of your choices. To say that God is sovereign, that he is working all things out according to his will, doesn't mean that your choices don't matter. But on the other hand, this is the tension, your choices never function to make God dependent upon them to do his will. As if you could thwart his purposes today in the world in which you live. So when Paul says the explanation is God in his grace has brought some to himself and others he has hardened, God has judged them, but they're culpable for their judgment. Okay? It's key ideas. Key ideas that are here. Well, what's happening? Well, God is at work judging secular Judaism even today. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ are under God's judgment, and he is working among them, even as at the same time, he's working among the Gentiles to use the Gentiles to stir up the Jews' jealousy for their own birthright. Okay? Yeah, so start. All right, now, let's come to the second one. Okay, if I haven't twisted your mind around yet, we're not done. Okay? Now, when we come here to verse 11, okay, I'm going to come to verse 11. Now, all of a sudden, since he's dealt with the idea that God, God uh, his promises fail, and, and uh, has he just given up on the Jews altogether? No, no, he's still saving Jews today, right? He's at work among them, even in his, his judgment work, to try to drive them to him by grace, right? To come to him for, by faith, through his grace, okay? Now, at the same time, though, this brings the Gentiles, and he says here, again, I ask, the same question, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery, right? Well, they clearly have stumbled. The majority of them have fallen. But is that, is that permanent? Is that over? Is God done with them? Well, the answer is no. He's not done with them. And now he's going to talk about, well, it seems like you, you've turned from them and your primary work is to, among the Gentiles, right? And so if you look at the church makeup today, it's predominantly Gentile. And there is only a small number of people who are ethnic Jews who have believed in Christ. Okay? Now, I, I think of this all, all often 
uh, because uh, how many of you know Daily Wire? This is not an advertisement, but I just need to bring this up. Daily Wire is a news program, podcast, different things along those lines. Uh, I am a, a, I'm a, sub, a subscriber for whatever that does to me, good or ill. I'm a subscriber, and I often listen to two Jews for my podcasts, okay? And I'm not saying that. Uh, I listen to Ben Shapiro, okay? Ben Shapiro is an Orthodox Jewish man, has a high regard for the Old Testament scriptures, but does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? Ben Shapiro. On the other hand, I listen to an artist uh, in that group. His name is Andrew Clavin. Andrew Clavin is a Jew. And Andrew Clavin came to Christ in his 40s. And so he talks about uh, his life as a Jew that ostracized him from his home of his birth, uh, that uh, his dad the only time his dad ever cared about anything that he was reading is when he picked up the Gospels to read them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And his dad was really, really upset that he was reading the New Testament because if you're an Orthodox Jew, the New Testament is not Scripture. Okay? So when he began to read the Gospels, that's when he began uh, to be acquainted with Jesus and became uh, a Jew who believed that Jesus was the Messiah that the Old Testament was looking forward to. Right? So it reminds me right, of this passage in the midst of what's going on. So Paul is going to come to the Gentiles here, and he's going to say that the Gentiles, your arrogance toward the Jews is ignorant and sinful. That's pretty powerful, right? as he says this here. And our key passage here is that he says, right, back up a little bit before I get to verse 17. He says, again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Now, this is something most people in this room are Gentiles. Okay? Now, this is interesting. God has the Jews still in mind as he's working around the globe among Gentiles. He wants to use the church to stir the Jews up to be jealous for their birthright. Right? So God has not forgotten them. And so he says, but if their transgression, meaning their rejection of Messiah Jesus, means riches for the world, meaning that now the, this good news about Jesus is being extended to the world in light of their rejection... And their loss means riches for the Gentiles. How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Right? Because the issue he's referring to, what will it be like for all of us when the God's people, the Jews, eventually turn to Messiah Jesus and, and worship him as their promised king? Because Paul is looking to that moment we're going to read about in a moment when Messiah Jesus will return and there will be a great ingathering of the Jews to himself which will mark the wrap-up of God's purposes in history and Christ's rule and reign. So where we are is we're stirring up Jews to jealousy. So verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? When there's a great ingathering. This is why there was, there was a hullabaloo if you were alive in the 70s, which a lot of you in here were not, uh, right? Uh, hullabaloo in life in the 70s and 60s and so forth. Back in 1948, when, when uh, they reestablished Israel, if you will, post-World War II, and there was a great ingathering of Jews all over the world to come back to the Holy Land. And then you had the, the Six-Day War and all those things that established the boundaries of Israel. This, so now people were starting to get excited about the fact maybe this is that in-time ingathering of the Jews. And on the one hand, there was excitement for a lot of different reasons, but it was largely a political entity. It was a political movement. There was no return to Jesus Messiah. What Paul's talking about here is a belief in Jesus as Messiah. Well, that didn't happen. That has not happened in modern Judaism. So that's what Paul was talking about here. So here, so they're home. Then verse 17, here's where we are. If some of the branches, 
right, that are a part of the vine have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in. By the way, there's a bunch of wild olive shoots sitting with me today, right, a bunch of unnatural branches grafted into promises that were not initially given to you, right? So we're grafted in, and we're into the nourishing sap of the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Right? Now, what Paul's talking about here is Gentiles are looking at the fact, well, look, we've made the right choice. Look, we're following Jesus. We're spiritually superior to the Jews. And not only do they think of that with regards to Jews who've not embraced Christ, but they also think of themselves that way with regards to Jewish brothers and sisters within the church. They think that their Jewish scruples and their concerns, we don't have time for you. We're more superior to you spiritually anyway. And what Paul's warning them of, that attitude that somehow you're spiritual in your own right, that somehow you're special and you earn this from God because you're good, that's not saving faith. That's indicative of the mentality of unsaved Jews who thought that just by virtue of their birth, just by virtue of their Jewishness, that they were rightly related to God. And Paul said, no, 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 it needs to be a a relationship by faith in God, a a humbling before them, not an attempt to establish your own righteousness, but a, a belief in God that lets him establish your righteousness. So he's warning the Gentiles about their arrogance, and he's saying God's not forgotten about the Jews. He's still working among them, and then you need to walk by faith just like the Jews do. You have no standing over them. And so what he's doing, he's leveling the congregation. There's Jews and Gentiles. There's no Gentiles and Jews, nor is there Jews and Gentiles. There's just the people of God, right? Now, the third thing then, in 25 to 31, God will fulfill, and this is where he looks to the future, God will fulfill his promise to bless the Jews individually and nationally and Gentiles through them when the Messiah returns. So key idea here in verse 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery Okay, for Paul, mystery doesn't mean mysterious, right? Here's some mysterious thing. It means something that God had hidden but now has revealed. And he's revealed it to Paul. And he's saying this to the Gentiles so that you may not be conceited, okay? Now, there's so many ways for us to take this here, um, If you're a follower of Jesus right here, I just want you to know that you get no credit. Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus, you get no credit um, because you had some unique spiritual insight. You are who you are by the grace of God. That means you have received all the blessings of God in Christ in the face of your open rebellion and your lack of desert, and God gave you something you didn't deserve. He didn't look out there and he was picking team, you know, uh, uh, people for his team and going, you know, I want Matt on my team. He's such a great, righteous guy. And I'm not going to pick Jake. He's a loser. Uh, I got Tommy. He's a great, righteous guy. Uh, Mike, he has good days and bad days. Uh, we'll see. He'll see if he can work his way up to team status. No, he looked over and he said, man, they're all lost. They're all rebels. They're all hopeless. They're all self-righteous. They all think that they can make it on their own. They don't think they need me. They're walking away from me. But in my grace, I'm going to go rescue them. That's why Paul would say, I am who I am by what? By the grace of God. And so if you have some sort of idea about yourself that, that God in his grace awakened you to the desperate condition you were in and has brought you to himself, that that gives you some sort of platform to stand and make you self-righteous, you don't understand who you were and what's happened to you. Right, So Paul says, Israel has experienced hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles have come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. That is written, the deliverer will come, yet to come, from Zion. He will turn godlessness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, we don't know when this is going to happen, but it's yet to happen. One of the things we'll mark, the return of Jesus, will be a great ingathering of Jews. There's going to be a great revival of 
of, of faith among Judy, uh, uh, Jews. And so God says, no, has his promises failed? No. Right now, he's saving a remnant by grace. Right now, even in his judgment, he's working among the Gentiles to stir the Jews up in jealousy for what their birthright is. And he's going to come and fulfill his personal and national promises to them. It's coming. Right? Now, here's what I want to think about. Coming to terms with God so we can truly live. Okay, I want, I want you to think about this with me. I'm right, going to come back to this idea. One of the happiest moments in life is when you find the courage to let go of what you cannot change. Okay, I really, fundamentally, life begins when you come to terms with God. And I want to say that you accept who He is. You accept His character. You accept His power. You accept who you are. You're finite. You're limited. You're dependent. You're absolutely needy. It begins, right? So let me talk about some of these things, right? I got a bunch of them. So if you're a blank filler, here's all your blanks, okay? Right? Think about this with me. You cannot outthink God. Now, that hasn't stopped many of us trying to outthink him, right? You can't outthink him. This is one of the things that's going to pause. His ways are inscrutable. Why? Because it's above your pay grade. It's above your capacity, and some of the, some of the things is, is to humble us, right? You can't overpower God, right? We'll talk more about how we try to overpower God. You can't overpower him. You can't, can't change the course of history, right? There's a lot of people who think, no, I can change the course of history just by retelling it, okay? Uh, you cannot outrun God as if you could take yourself someplace where he could not reach you, right? Now, all of these all of these have implications. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's great comfort here, but also sometimes a rebuke. I mean, how many times have we thought, you know, hey, God, I trust that you're God and everything else, but I got a few words of counsel for you about how you're running my life. You know, if you ever want to consult me, God, I got a few good things here uh, that I'd like to let you know, and I, I don't think that what you're doing right now is really fair. I don't, I don't like the gifts you've given me. I don't like the body you've given me to work my life with. I don't like the skills that I have. You know, God, you know, if I would redesign things, I'm sure I could work it out a little bit better. And we're angry with God about what we feel he could have done better, right? So here's another one. You can't improve on God's character or will, right? This happens all the time. Uh, people who, if they were God, they would know exactly how he would love. And so they say, well, I'm sure God would be happy with this. God would be reasonable like me, right? And, and you don't begin with you. You go, so, well, who is God? And what, what, what does it mean that he has loved us in Christ? And we start from there to talk about what love looks like, not what I think is reasonable that somebody would do if they're loving, right? And then you cannot put God in your debt by doing something that obligates him to do something for you, right? Right here in the middle, sometimes as followers of Jesus, we think, you know, God, I, I've been going to church all the time. I've put up with a lot of irritating people at EBC. God, I mean, I've put up with the years of I irritating people. I should get some brownie points for that, right? And then you may even name a few people, and then you feel guilty, and you don't do that, right? Uh, you know, God, I, I have put up with some sad preaching. You know, Greg, sometimes he hits it, sometimes not so much. Uh, I put up with these kind of things, God. I, I've done all these kind of things. God, you owe me. You're asking too much of me. This one here, the top one, you cannot manipulate God, right? We have a lot of that happening in the present. We even, we even coined a new term that we call cry bullies, right? So you get somebody in front of you that is, is weeping and crying and, and, and yelling that you're hurting them. And, and so you feel overwhelmed. You don't know how to do it. And, and you say, okay, 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 right, well, stop, just stop, 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 we'll take care of that. We have a society full of cry bullies. But when it comes to God, you can't manipulate him by your flattery, right? When you're talking to God in your prayer, it's not like you're buttering him up to say, I'm going to say five good things to you, God, so that I can get what I want from you, right? You can't flatter your way. Your tears, your threats, your silence, right? Here's the common one. By your appeal to the popularity of your views, that somehow, you know, 
everybody on TikTok agrees with me, right? I'm in the majority, right? Some survey comes out and says, this is what's reasonable. And Paul says, well, let God be true and every man a liar. So you can't change him by a poll. You can't coerce. You can't rewrite God as if God is up there dependent upon you and swayed by you, right, to make up his mind and work his ways in, in history, okay? You can't ignore God as if you could take yourself out from under his sovereign care. Now, for everyone who knows Jesus, praise God for that. I can't ignore him because sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I'm knocked on my backside. Sometimes those as if I could somehow ignore God and he would go away. Well, no, you can't escape the limitations that he's built into your design and the design of the world he made for you. This is one of the loving things. This is what Pastor Van was talking about. I believe And I I have to say this, not because I want to preach on it all the time, because it's what's being argued against every time that people are being barraged with every day. I I believe that if you're a man, that that's an assignment from God. You've been created to be a man. And your ability to flourish as a human being is, is accepting what God has made you to be. And I recognize for some people that is really hard. And I recognize... For many young people, they're being lied to to think that the struggles that they face as a young person can be alleviated by turning against the the person that God has made them to be. If you're a woman, you were assigned a female body and a female existence. God gave the sonogram person didn't assign you that. Your parents didn't assign you that. Your parents can't unassign you. They can't unassign you. And I think one of the most evil things that's happening right now is parents telling little children that I can unassign you. Okay? You cannot escape those, but the joy is to live within those boundaries. This, we could say this on so many things. You can't escape the fact that God has bounded your sexual desires to be expressed in particular ways and in particular places. And you can't escape the fact that when you exercise them outside those boundaries and against his intentions, it will destroy you and destroy other people. You can't escape the limitations, but the limitations are where freedom is found and joy is found. Right? You cannot deny the privileges and capabilities that God has given you as a creature. It is not true, if you're depressed here today, that you don't have something to offer. No, God has created you in his image. And if you've been convinced because you've been out looking at other people and what they have that somehow you don't measure up, you're using the wrong standard and you're not looking direct to God. And God says, no, no, you're mine. I've created you. You've got purpose. You've got meaning, right? You don't have to look like them. You don't have to have the same skills. I don't have everybody who has the same skills. That's not the measure of your worth. The measure of your worth is you're created in my image, and I want you to be my son and daughter. You can't deny that. You can't stand back. When you stand back from this church and, not, and think that you don't have anything to offer, you're just saying to God, God, you just didn't give me anything. God says, no, that's not true. You're robbing from them what I gave you for them. Third thing, you cannot shirk your responsibilities toward God, right? God, if you're a believer, God loves you too much to let you walk your own way. He's going to go after you. He is going to go after you because he's a father who disciplines his kids. You can't shirk him. If you don't know God and you haven't come to know Jesus Christ, you can't get out from underneath the responsibility you have. Now, I'm going to say something really radical, and it sounds crazy, but you have a responsibility as a creature to give God his due because he created you. You can't get away from that responsibility. And then you cannot claim ignorance that you do not know that God exists or what he requires. This is what Paul has been saying all along. The word is near you. Right? It's near you. Okay? You cannot find and enjoy the path of real life, the path set out by the loving Father apart from God. You cannot truly overcome the darkness in your own soul and the darkness around you without God, right? My wife, sometimes uh, I listen to a lot of different things. Sometimes she just can't listen with me because the darkness that sometimes I'm wading through and thinking about just overwhelms her, right? As a teacher, it overwhelms her. The stuff she confronts at school overwhelms her. 
how are you going to deal with the darkness in your own soul, the sin in your own soul, the lust, the greed, the pride, the selfishness, the anger? How are you going to overcome that? Well, a lot of people are going to give you some tips on how to try to, try to adjust your behavior, but the only one that can overcome the darkness in your own soul is the one who can give you a new heart, right, to do that. You cannot truly love and give love without first accepting God's love in Christ. This, I think, is the wager of all of Scripture because you know the two greatest commands. What's the first command? You will what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then what's the second command? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, in Scripture, the second command is made possible by doing the first command. Right? Why? Because God will make you someone who wants to love your neighbor instead of use your neighbor. And then God will teach you what it means to love your neighbor as you come to understand yourself as God has created you. As you are awakened to your own identity and God's purposes, well, then you yearn for other people to have what you know in Jesus. And then he will enable you to press out toward people, right, to love them. And then you cannot look at life and death fully with a justifiable sense of purpose, meaning and hope, right? We were at a funeral yesterday, and I want to say the Christianity looks death in the face. I mean seriously looks it in the face, right? And everyone in here is going to face death, and it may not be today, may not be tomorrow, but it's surely coming, okay? And you cannot really live until you've taken death seriously. Is there any hope beyond it? Is there anyone who can deliver me from it? And if life really is just this short little journey and then it all comes to an end and then I'm forgotten, is that really all that life is? What is life worth living for? Okay. Then you cannot truly find life apart from God. Okay. Now, I know I've come to the end, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an audible for my, my singers. I'm sorry. But... If you're writing down some questions that I want you to think about, and I just think about one here. Um, my poor family, I'm, I'm the pastor, professor guy. So I, I, I try not to barrage them with stuff that I'm thinking about all the time because they expect that from me. One of my daughters sent me a little funny little reel the other day of what it was like when dad was trying to share some deep thought when the girls were little. And it was a, a dad speaking to his family and everybody was gone chaos. And I, me getting irritated. Well, that was very common, right? Uh, and that, because I, I have something I want to tell him. Um, so yesterday I was walking. I was walking out on the bike path yesterday with my dog. And uh, it was so pretty. And the wind was blowing. And I was thinking about it. I was thinking about the God who made everything. And even at this uh, stage in my life, you know, you, you start to, to change from uh, envisioning a career to thinking about, okay, God, am I in the fourth quarter? Am I at the end of the third quarter? Am I in the fourth quarter? Um, how, do I, how, do I, how do I end life well? How do I walk out the rest of the time that you give me well? Um, and one of the things that I just kept coming back to more and more is that the thing that I need in this stage of life, like you need if you're in college, like you need if you're in your 30s or 40s, is you need to start navigating that stage by getting God right. You need to know who it is that you need to orient your life around. Who should tell you what a good life is? Who's the only one that can secure you from the things that really threaten you? Who's the one that has the credentials to tell you what a good life is? So as you're thinking today, as you get in your small groups and you go after them, what is a falsehood about God that you need to let go of? What is something there? What question about God is giving you an excuse for not enjoying, trusting, and obeying him? Now, this one's a hard one. If you've ever had a real tragedy in your life or a reversal, I met Christians all the time that exist with God like an abused child. They're, they're too afraid to run, but they're too angry to draw near. 
And so they take that as a reason to withdraw their affection from God. They no longer enjoy Him. They're not running from Him per se because they don't know where else to go, but they're certainly not moving toward Him as Father. And what we've learned as we've come through that God, the Spirit of God is busy saying, no, no, He's your Abba. He's your dad. You need to move close to him, right? What is that? What distortion of God is robbing you of the life that God wants you to know? You know, as a a counselor often, I, I know I've said this to you, my job for people is to be loyal to Jesus for their sake. We like to tell ourselves things about God that lets us do things that we want to do instead of constrain our lives by what God calls us to do, right? What foolish accusation against God do you need to repent of? That's a hard one, is it not? Have you accused God of something? Do you need to repent of that? And what truth about God do you need to embrace to ask God to help you by His Spirit to enjoy and live out from? Let me say one, and I'm going to pray for it at the end. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, you are loved in a way that you cannot comprehend. A love that should settle your soul, give you great security, empower your obedience, calm your fears, lessen your anxiety, right? And this is something I pray for myself all the time, that God would, by His grace, let me understand more of what it means to be loved by Christ. What is it that you need? You need God's power to be displayed to you, right? His worthiness. This whole section is a defense of God's glory. What is God's glory in this thing? It's, it's using glory to speak of his excellencies. When we give praise to God, give glory to God, we're reciting his excellencies, right? What is it you need to be reminded of? Would you stand with me and we're going to be pray. We're going to pray and I'll dismiss you. Dear Heavenly Father, today, what I feel uh, as a son, how do I give an appropriate uh, account of your greatness? How do I display it, Lord, for your people? Lord, I'm an inadequate... uh, instrument for drawing them into the wonders of your power and of your character. Lord, please, please forgive us as your people for diminishing you, uh, for pushing you aside in our lives, uh, for thinking that your advice, your counsel uh, is not the wisest counsel we can find. Lord, that that your ways are not the best ways to live. Lord, forgive us in ways that we elevate other voices. Forgive us in ways that we've misrepresented you to make other people feel better. And Lord, in the process, we've diminished your glory and we've distracted them from the God they truly need to know. Lord, please help us, Lord, to grow in our ability to worship you, uh, to be humbled before you, uh, Lord, to willingly and uh, with anticipation obey you. Lord, because from you, Lord, everything that exists, you made. Through you, everything that's still going on, Lord, it's because you sustain it. And for you, everything is moving toward the goal that you have made it. Lord, you are the one person to be reckoned with in all of life. Lord, I pray for these dear friends and brothers and sisters here. Lord, if there's one among us who's not come to you and recognized who you are, Lord, please would you open their heart to be able to see you for who you are, be overwhelmed by your goodness and grace, bow before you and ask for your forgiveness and come to you and receive the forgiveness and life that you want them to know. Lord, I pray for us who are followers of Christ, please would you by your spirit, open the eyes of our heart to be able to perceive the height and width and length and breadth of the love of Jesus. May it calm our fears. 
May it lessen our anxiety. May it impel our obedience. Lord, may it restrain us from sin. Lord, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.